Hello, welcome everyone. Sorry, we had two two links, but hopefully everyone's in the right place now. I'm Lisa Sullivan. I'm here at UC Davis, lecture supervisor, and I'll be sharing my screen in just a moment. So sorry about that. <laughs> All right, Rebecca Ambrose, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Rebecca Ambrose, and I'm on the faculty here at UC Davis um, and worked as the director of teacher education for a few years. Um, and uh, I'm just happy to see everybody. Uh, just as a heads up to Lisa and Andrew, I was waiting in a different room. We so. ended our room and came over here. So we had, for some reason, multiple okay. links. So um, uh, hopefully, people are finding us. and. Uh, it's really exciting to be with, with you all today. And I need Thank to- Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, all right. So I'll just, Rebecca and I are gonna, you know, share together, take different slides. So here's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna share some of the courage stories and, and how we, a little bit about how we collected them. Um, and uh, the background about that. We'll also have a small group discussion about those stories um, and what it looks like to be courageous as a student teacher. Um, we'll have multiple discussion sections and we're gonna share different sets of stories about student teachers who were both courageous and some who kind of struggled to be courageous. So, and then Rebecca, this is you. Um. So the um, stories we're sharing with you today are um, some that we collected a few years back. And we were curious to see how our candidates were interpreting our program's um, pillar of uh, advocating for equity. So we've basically met with all 75 of our candidates in groups of five or six and asked them um, the question, one of you had to be courageous this year and speak up on behalf of yourself or your students. And part of the speak up for yourself piece of this came from a conversation I had with Matt Wallace, where um, when I asked him how he thought our candidates were advocating for equity, he said, well, some of them struggle to even advocate for themselves. And so we added that piece to the question to see if, um, that was a challenge for some of them. All right, next slide. Oh, um, right. yeah. yeah, I think this is me. So why why is this important? Um, we recognized, you know, as we were thinking about our program pillars and our values that we really need courageous teachers to address some of the systemic inequities and racism various other challenges that are very real in our K-12 school context and beyond. So as Frere has said, courage is one of the indispensable qualities of a progressive teacher. And we believe as well that advocating for equity in order to challenge the status quo is important so that we can begin addressing some of these um, issues in you know, racism and the marginalization of students. Uh, another uh, body of work that we drew on was this idea of uh, learning how to have crucial conversations and more difficult conversations. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the sort of power dynamics and the um, positionality of student teachers in their um, field work placements, so. So the other thing that we recognize is many of our candidates are really good students. They come to us um, in this position of having really followed the rules, been um, gone along, been good students. Um, they may not have been socialized to question, to challenge authority, to have a critical consciousness that we believe is really important for um, the next generation of teachers. So as Rebecca mentioned, one of the questions we had is if our candidates cannot speak up for themselves, how will they 
you know, have the courage to advocate and speak up for their students. So these were some of the ideas that were um, at the forefront of our thinking when we started to have these conversations with student teachers. Um, and as a math educator, I've found um, Rochelle Gutierrez's work useful. Um, she talks about creative insubordination and how um, teachers who are advocates for equity often have to resist the, um, the system itself. And how do they go about doing that? And how can we help our pre-service teachers to develop what she calls the political agility um, to negotiate these contexts. Um, and she talks about creative insubordination as including the following acts, decentering decentering the achievement gap, questioning the curriculum presented in school, highlighting the humanity behind the creation of knowledge, positioning students as authors of ideas and challenging deficit narratives about students of color. And um, I'll take this opportunity to just add that um, I'm not sure where Lisa found it, but we were, she and I read a, an article over the weekend that was about um, supervisors working toward justice and how our candidates nowadays, at least some of them, are looking for help in challenging deficit narratives. They're hearing them from their teachers in some cases and um, are being more proactive in wanting to address them. So, um, we that, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Go I was ahead. just going to say that article is in our um, resources folder. So if you're interested in what Rebecca's mentioning, you might look at that later. Sorry to interrupt. No, that let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so we know from some research about um, the challenges that new, new teachers have in advocating for equity, and they um, worry about alienating administrators, um, especially when they don't yet have tenure. Um, but our hope is that courageous behavior is contagious and uh, reticent individuals can be inspired to action when they see peers stepping up. So um, we actually hope that um, student teachers can um, encourage one another in these courageous activities, as well as being encouraged by their um, supervisors. And um, while many candidates have the motivation and interest to disrupt problematic viewpoints and language, they lack the working capital and expertise to do, do so. And this comes from that article that I was just mentioning. So, um, and it's, we don't want to label individuals as being courageous or not. We want to recognize that this is something that um, is a choice that people make from time to time. And uh, often they're looking to their supervisor for advice about when to do it and how to do it. And um, we'll be talking, well, we're going to put you in um, a role play later today. <laughs> All right, so this is, we're going to have the first of several small groups, just, you know, based on what you've just heard um, and your own thinking, thinking about what it means to be courageous. So we would like for you to introduce yourselves, maybe share your Padlet if you want, anything else you want to share, and think maybe how you would define courage in one or two words. And then um, what role does being courageous play in your life, if any? And finally, do you think being courageous is important for pre-service teachers? Is this something I would assume you're here as part of this workshop that you're interested in this topic and, and maybe how to help, help your uh, pre-service teachers in this area. So I will drop those questions. The Padlet, we will share a link to the Padlet in the chat. I'll try to do that while you're in your groups. And then I will also cut these um, questions and put them in the chat so you can look at them when you're in your breakout rooms. Um, and I just wanna give credit and and it was Andrew Hood who shared that article with me, Rebecca, I think I mentioned that. So Andrew, will you um, 
start breakout rooms and we're going to give you um, about five minutes in this group to discuss these prompts. Yeah, and uh, how many groups Let's of how many would you 43. Want? So can we do uh, groups of four? Yeah, and, so that'll yes. be... Oh. And we're going to want to keep these groups for the whole time. 10 breakout rooms, okay. Thank you. Per room. And we'll set a timer so you know when you need to come back for five minutes. Any questions before we send you off into, into a breakout room? I know someone asked about the Padlet. We'll add that. We'll add that to the chat as well. Okay. No questions. Right. Have a great conversation. Okay. So if you have, I hope that you had a good conversation about what it means to be um, courageous. Um, if you have anything you'd like to share, a highlight, please feel free to put that in the chat. We would love to hear how the conversation went or any highlights, but we will move. So on. Uh, Lisa, yeah. so uh, yes. uh, again, this is Ramon. So we were uh, discussing um, defining equity in one or two words. And so I was just about, which I didn't get to say, so I'll say just pursuing equity. But, um, you know, there's so much more than that, of course. And so uh, uh, I'd, like, I'd be interested in hearing what others have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. I put that in the chat just in case somebody missed it. All right, Rebecca, is this you? Well, and I'm seeing another definition of- Oh, like, great. Sorry, I missed that. Putting passion into action. Um, mm. And Mandy, I'm sorry to see that you're getting background noise because uh, I think the rest of us are not getting that. Um, mm. And so- I, I don't we, we, I had it before. I had it when we were first, um, when we first met and then it carried on into the breakout. Yes, yeah, so it's on now. And we, we can hear on. it, yeah. Hmm. Well, do you have two devices going, Mandy? No. Okay. Just, one. Just one. Do you have a headset? I don't know. You might want to go out and come back in. That might help it. Um, yeah, you might want to leave the meeting and come back. That's a good idea. So um, these stories of courage, we um, audio recorded them so that we could make transcripts of them. And uh, then we did some analysis and um, we looked at them to see the kinds of um, situations that the pre-service teachers were talking about when they told these stories of courage. And we uh, broke them up into four main categories based on what they were telling us, which included um, speaking up on behalf of children and students, um, some covert actions, um, in addition to speaking up, some overt actions, and then some that were more um, specific to speaking up for, for themselves. So the next slide, is this my slide? Let's see. Yes, I believe this is. Um, yeah, so um, one of the stories that we heard was from a um, candidate who was in a third grade classroom. And she noticed that one of the students was being um, consistently sent to um, a kindergarten classroom when the teacher was unhappy with the child's behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, she asked the, the mentor teacher about why he was doing it. And I will add that she took it took her a long time to be able to ask this question. So it wasn't um, on the first few occasions when she saw this, um, but after it became clear to her that this was a pattern, um, uh, she asked why he was doing it. And the uh, mentor teacher explained that he wanted to, he was intentionally embarrassing the student, um, hoping that, uh, it would be aversive to her to go down to the, the kindergarten classroom. And um, the candidate followed it up with uh, whether he had tried something else. And um, I think 
she felt that she was courageous in that situation because, um, because she asked. Um, instead of just ignoring it or assuming that that, that was good practice. And um, the good news about this situation was that just by asking the question, the teacher, I think, reflected on what they were doing and decided to do something else. Um, and uh, the child was able to stay in the classroom and not have to endure the um, the shame of going to other classrooms. Thanks, Rebecca. We I just want to share that we have a comment in the chat um, related to you know related to what you just said that um, that story, this idea of taking risks, step, stepping out of a, our comfort zone, and how some teachers really student teachers really struggle when they're learning. Um, and in that are mentor teacher's classroom. So it can be a, a hard, difficult, you know, kind of situation. When do you speak up? What do you say? How do you, how do you speak up? So we're going to be talking about all of that. Um, I think this is you as well, Rebecca, and then I'll do the next one. Okay. Um, so um, this was a really profound um, story, and I happened to know the mentor teacher that the student was, um, the candidate was was talking about, and um, and I will just share that I think that this was um, a very experienced teacher who was going through a rough year, and in this particular case, the um, kindergartners were doing an assessment and the teacher grabbed the assessment paper from a child and threw it away. And um, this was a child who was a foster child and had been facing some real challenges in their home situation. And um, the student teacher um, thought that this was a, a, an inappropriate thing for the teacher to do. And um, I think had been challenged the whole year by seeing that this, that the mentor teacher that year was um, very punitive with her students and it was very troubling to the, the candidate. And so she told us in her story, something inside of me, I've struggled with speaking up to her all year, but I didn't even think twice about it this time. And I looked at her and I said, I think it's traumatizing to do that. In that moment, I was able to voice how I felt and stay true to myself. It's hard to stand up in a classroom that's not your own in a school that you don't work at. That moment gave me courage. And I will add that this um, particular candidate tended to be a very soft-spoken person. And I think that her identifying with this child helped her to speak on behalf of the child and um, also seeing the strong reaction of the child to having the paper grabbed away from him um, gave her the courage in the moment to do this. Um, so that unlike the previous story where the uh, candidate had been kind of planning for a long period of time. This was um, something that was much more spontaneous and in the moment um, and led this individual to um, be able to, to advocate in this way. Thank you. All right. So the next story is um, from a candidate who described his concern about a pretty strict and rigid policy where the fifth grade students in his um, student teaching placement without their homework would have to stay in and do it during recess. So it really troubled him, this policy. He brought it up in a grade level meeting and said, we are punishing the students for their lack of control of their environment. And I don't think that's okay. So he, he explained that he felt, you know, kind of singling out these students, making them stay in, was punishing them for something that they don't have control over. So maybe, you know, parents that are in, unable to help them at home or just an environment where they're unable to complete their homework. 
So in this case, his story, um, his comments had made a difference. So, um, and there were changes made, but part of what made led him to stand up was that he reflected back on his own experiences as a fifth grader living with his grandmother with limited English um, who had a 12 hour a day job. So he had that personal experience that connected to his students that led him to, you know, question this policy. In terms of more sort of overt actions, um, we had a candidate talk about wanting her kindergarten students to write a paragraph, um, despite the resistance that her um, mentor or partner teacher was expressing. And the teacher felt this was something that they weren't gonna be capable of doing. And she described her partner teacher being really adamant and the candidate ignored this sort of what she viewed as deficit thinking and stuck with her plan. And she said, our kids are so ready for this. We can challenge them to do that. Students who might need additional support, we can scaffold it for them. And one thing that she did was to say, <laughs> she blamed the program and said that the university instructors wanted to see this happen and wanted to see what the children could were capable of doing. And it actually was a successful lesson and it worked out well. So she felt like this was an instance of being courageous for her to go ahead and, and proceed with this plan. Um, and just as a matter of clarification, in that case, the partner teacher was actually um, not her resident teacher. She was doing that during her takeover. And um, it was the other kindergarten teacher who um, expressed some reservations about whether the children would be able to do it or not. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in this case, this was a, another of the more dramatic stories that we heard. And um, the candidate said there was a school shooting that morning, which is why all the teachers were talking about it. She was in the lunchroom at this time. And this other teacher was laughing about it. Our school is in a low income area. And she was saying, I am surprised that our school hasn't been shot up because look at where we're teaching and look at our neighborhood. If all of these school shootings are going to start happening, then I definitely want a gun. I don't wanna get shot. And then she started going on about her students and saying appropriate things about them. And so um, the candidate said that I stood up and said, honestly, I would gladly take a bullet for any of my students before I would ever grab a gun or arm myself. Um, the other teacher looked at her and was like, okay. And then I left and walked out and went to my classroom. My RT mentor teacher came after me and was like, oh my God, that was amazing. Um, and when she was telling us this story, she noted that this individual um, in the teacher's lunchroom was, um, was often very vocal and the other teachers uh, tended to kind of smile and laugh at what she said. Um, and the mentor teacher's reaction by giving her those words of encouragement suggested to, to me anyway, that uh, there was a lot of silent um, concern about what, what the other teachers were hearing and that the student teacher um, was voicing what many of the people wished that they could say to this particular individual. Yeah, you just made me think that in some ways for the student teacher who maybe won't be working with these people in the long term, sometimes they maybe feel more empowered if they know, you know, they have a a job or a position somewhere else next year. So interesting to think about those dynamics. All right, I think this might be the next, the, the final story we have to share about students speaking up. So this candidate and NH explained that she didn't know what to say when her RT told her that she didn't need to try to make her lessons culturally relevant. 
So instead of sort of getting into a conversation, she chose to operate in kind of a bubble. So her RT wouldn't see her going behind her back and just kind of moving ahead with her plans. But it struck her in the heart, she said, that her, her RT had low expectations for her students and did not see the value in culturally relevant lessons. So um, this was a case where you know, more, more covert actions were taken to, to design lessons that were culturally relevant without necessarily including the rest of the teacher. All right, so we want to put you back into your same groups now that you've met those folks and think about any stories you have of your own student teachers maybe being assertive in the ways that these stories we've just shared um, showed. And if so, was there anything you did to support their courageous actions? And if not, maybe thinking about and reflecting on why that might not have happened. And then what are some things you think he, a supervisor might do to support these kinds of actions? So we will give you five minutes to discuss these questions. I'll make sure to put them in the chat. So I'm doing that now. Um, any questions before we begin? Welcome back if you're joining us. <laughs> All right, welcome back. A few more people popping in. Hopefully you had a good conversation. It would be great to um, share a highlight if you have some one or two from the discussion that would be that would be great i know time does fly in the groups the next group is going to be a little bit longer so you'll have a little bit more time to chat with that same group um all right we're going to continue on because we want to have time for you to do the next activity so um we didn't hear that many of those assertive stories so i'd say that we had about between 12 and 15 um, folks who did something that was um, pretty bold. We had a lot of stories about um, candidates who helped their cooperating teacher develop cases to get extra services for children. Um, but then we had some students or candidates who talked about how they weren't courageous even though there were some situations that they would have liked to address. And here's how one of them explained that. It's such a weird thing being a student teacher. On the one hand, you think of them as your kids, but at the end of the day, you are an interloper. There were a couple of times when I wanted to advocate, but I couldn't quite figure out how to do it. I would tentatively broach the conversation with my RT, who is a wonderful person, but she does not deal with conflict or confrontation really well and would like a way to gracefully lead the conversation. Um, so the next slide, Lisa. Um, some other uh, comments were um, that she saw that her, um, her, resident teacher wasn't sticking up for herself in um, meetings where they were discussing um, the needs of their children. And so she was confused herself about how she might go about being an advocate for equity. Another um, noted that um, she, like the first person we saw, just didn't feel like she was an equal and had a voice. Another um, PST talked about how the RT had authority over her and she was worried about the uh, recommendation that her RT might be giving her. RT stands for resident teacher, thank you. And, um, and some wanted to um, address the negative discourse, the deficit, um, discourse that they were seeing at their school site, but they didn't want to be perceived as being um, disrespectful of, of the resident teachers. And then as Rebecca mentioned um, in one of those stories, many of our candidates described that their mentor teachers were really strong advocates. So they saw themselves more as partners and um, 
there wasn't this really strong need for them to necessarily advocate. So that was, that was encouraging to hear. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to the next activity. Yes, I'm just gonna highlight what Johnny mentioned. I, I did wanna say that these are experiences that are happening in settings where we take a lot of time to select mentor teachers, resident teachers to work with our student teachers. So we're selecting folks who we believe have really um, positive and equitable classrooms, but these situations, you know, the reality is that they happen in, in a lot of settings. And as one of the stories mentioned, the RT was having a really challenging year herself personally. So she was struggling in that way. So what we would like to do now is put you into your small group, back into your small group, and we're gonna have you do a little role-playing activity. So we'll have two people um, take turns. And if there are four people in your group, hopefully you'll have a chance to all four of you take on one role. So one of you will be the candidate and one of you will be the supervisor. The listeners in that conversation can serve as consultants if anybody gets stuck. And we're gonna give you some scenarios in just a second. So I would suggest about five minutes per scenario. And we want you to start with the candidate coming to you and saying, what should I do in this situation? How would you respond? And then maybe the candidate reacts. Um, so you might think about the way a candidate would, would react where they're a little bit reluctant. Um, so here are the scenarios and we will make sure to put these into the chat. But I also encourage you if you have your own example that you want the group to role play, um, you could share that example or use one of the stories that we just, just shared. But these are the examples and the scenarios. So we'll go ahead and let you get started. Jump in, I know role playing can be a little um, <laughs> scary, but we are amongst friends. And I think this is a good way to, to stretch ourselves to, um, Rebecca and I role played one of these and I, I struggled, I needed a lifeline. So um, enjoy, have fun with it. Um, and we will come back together. You'll have, as I said, five minutes for two different scenarios. So we'll come back in about 10 minutes. So we'll set the timer for that. Any questions? Hello and welcome back. I hope that went well. We, we wanted to ask, can you give us a thumbs up if you did the role-playing activity? All right, <laughs> thanks, good to see you. We, we wanna um, thank you for your courage in doing that because it yeah. can be awkward to do role plays, but um, thanks for giving it a try. It's very yeah. different to try to Put yourself in those positions, I think. And if you have any highlights, something you want to share based on your discussion, it would be great to see. Yeah, sorry to the time, didn't have enough time, unfortunately. Um, this is something that at the end of the day we can talk about or at the lunch, lunch open session if you um, want to share. Good. Power of teamwork. Yes, fabulous. Um, so we want to just leave you, we have a 10 minute break now until the next session, but just thinking about, you know, our roles in this conversation and the importance of us, you know, getting out of our comfort zones to encourage our candidates to get out of theirs, being, um, you know, the role of us being brave and courageous. And I think that's important to consider. So, um, Thank you for being a part of this workshop. Um, good, I'm glad. I'm glad to see the comments here. Good, you had a good discussion, didn't necessarily role play. We assumed that might happen. These are all real examples that we've gotten from our student teachers. So I'm sure you have your own stories that came to mind. So we are going to put the links to the 1110 sessions. There they are. We have equity through engagement. Um, three, uh, two colleagues here at UC Davis and um, San Jose State, and then lesson study protocol.
protocol to enhance development um, by our colleague Johnny Wilson at UC Santa Cruz. So, can you say what development means? Enhanced development in practice. So, Lesson study protocol to enhance in my um, interpretation of what he means by this title um, is to enhance the development of student teachers. So their practice, enhance the development of their practice. Does that help? Johnny's right here if he wants to. Oh, say. Johnny, you want to yeah. explain? Yeah, Maybe. it's just a way of, of making the most of what they bring to their teaching experiences in the field so they can essentially move themselves together towards better practice and better understanding of their teaching. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for having me give me a chance to share that. Yeah. All right. And then we have one more comment here that a couple strategies that were shared in the breakout room. Paula shared um using a student teacher maybe to help communicate with a parent, suggested using pro program guidelines as an excuse. I know that we've had student teachers do that as well. They say, I have to do this because my program expects me to do this when they're put in a challenging situation or they maybe get some resistance. So thanks for sharing. Okay, we're gonna wrap up there. Thanks for being here. We'll see you in the next work set of workshops. Thanks everyone. Take well, care. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Adios.